my name's Conor McQuaid. I'm uh, originally from Northern Ireland and I'm a second year PhD student at the Open University. My original spark in science, it comes from my parents, I suppose, originally, uh, and my family. My parents are both teachers. Uh, my mother uh, did biology and then um, my father was a secondary school teacher, kind of translated history. But um, I, both sides of my family has um, Alzheimer's. Uh, so I never got to meet my father's parents and um, my mother's uh, father died when I was three. My uh, grandmother on that side died just in the last couple of years. So I've seen the disease, all the steps of it, and I kind of, if I can do something about it, that would be kind of nice. I'll be honest, at the start, I didn't know the Open University had a solid campus, but very quickly when I read up on the group's research, I realized they're world leaders in some of the stuff that they're doing. When I got to come here for an interview, I was just blown away by how good the labs were. I mean, it helps having no undergraduates, which means the place is a bit quieter and a bit, it's a bit odd in that regard compared to other universities, but it's definitely got some cutting edge technology and it's really a top notch. I'm Professor David Mail. I'm Professor of Biology at the Open University, and our research here is concerned primarily with how to get therapeutic agents into the brain. We have two or three thousand people here on the campus and although our undergraduates are distributed all over the country and indeed all around the world, we have excellent research labs with microscopy, tissue culture, electron microscopes here, uh, which are ideal for doing this kind of work. At school, Connor developed an interest in science, particularly medicine and zoology, so he took A-levels in the three sciences. That led him to Queen's University Belfast and a degree in biomedical sciences. He originally had his sights set on a career in medical practice, but decided he could make a greater contribution for good in research. While studying for a master's degree at the University of Liverpool, he met David Mayle at a conference, who encouraged him to apply for a PhD studentship at the Open University. My research mainly depends on the structure known as the blood-brain barrier. So the brain has got this very useful protective shield against, um, to control what goes in and out of it. And this is needed obviously because the brain's very important to us and it needs to be protected. The blood-brain barrier is something that has evolved to protect us against toxic molecules. Say, for example, if you were at a bad mushroom or came in contact with an insecticide, these toxic molecules would cross from the blood into the brain and would then uh, cause damage, very bad. So we've evolved these mechanisms to protect the brain. The problem is that also the therapeutic agents are foreign molecules and the blood brain barrier prevents those from crossing as well. So we've got a advantageous system, but it's acting against us when we need to treat disease. 95% of all the drugs that have been developed to treat neurological issues can't get past this barrier or not at least in sufficient amount to be useful. For example, brain tumours, psychiatric diseases, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, all of those conditions, the drugs that could be used to treat them, do not enter the brain because they're blocked. And most of the new treatments for disease are biological treatments, things like gene therapies and uh, proteins which are called cytokines and they're completely excluded from getting into the brain. And so the, the key problem for us is what mechanism can we use to get those agents across the blood-brain barrier? The solution being worked on at the Open University involves using sub-microscopic gold particles as carriers. So the reason we use um, nanoparticles and, and specifically gold nanoparticles is one because of their size. So it's very, very small. So if you take the size of a cell, which you can barely see under a light microscope, nanoparticles are a thousand the size of those cells. They're so small that actually they behave very similar like some proteins in the way that they can integrate into the cell. So we have to use very specialized equipment even to visualize them. Gold has some chemical and biological properties that make it stand out. Biologically it is pretty inert and so it shouldn't be causing immune responses like some of the other metals and also because of the chemistry we can attach things onto the surface and that makes it quite a useful carrier system. The whole area that we're working on arose almost completely by accident when my 
original PhD supervisor, who is 89 and who is still working in science, came to me and said, you couldn't by any chance tell me whether these nanoparticles that we're working with cross uh, endothelial cells, which are one of the components of the blood-brain barrier. And I said to him, oh, well, yeah, we'll take a look, expecting the answer to be no, it, it doesn't, and that would be the end of the story. And then when we looked, we were astonished. We found that these gold nanoparticles that he was using cross the blood-brain barrier in vitro very, very well indeed. And this led to a sort of jumping off to a whole new area of research and people like Connor and my other PhD students have been working on this area to develop it. At this early stage of research, Connor is using cells cultured on a plate to mimic the action of the blood-brain barrier in a living organism. We use a cellular model which is based on a, on a very special cell which we have produced that behaves just like the cells of the blood-brain barrier. They're kind of like having a pet. We have to make sure they're warm, we have to make sure they're fed, and we have to make sure they don't get ill. They have a special medium, which is the things that they grow in and has all their food. So that needs to be kept sterile so that no bacteria starts to grow and can then infect them. And this is also why we do things in flow hoods, because it extracts the air and should keep the place relatively clean. We also ethanol things to make sure that if any bacteria or anything is on it, it is killed before it's exposed. We wear lab clothes, we wear gloves, and we, we check routinely to make sure that these cells not only aren't infected, but are behaving the way that we would expect them to do in healthy conditions. A PhD student will usually have come from doing an undergraduate degree or possibly a master's degree, and they will come and join us in the laboratory, having gone through an interviewing process, and uh, they will start by learning how to do basic tissue culture of the cells that we're involved in. So it may take uh, two or three months. At the same time, we will be discussing the broad scope of the experiments, what we need to find out. So a question might be, how many genes can we get onto a nanoparticle and it still crosses the brain? And we, we focus on that particular question and work out the experiments that need to be done. And then the student will take them away and will come back as soon as they've got some results. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And uh, at that stage, um, we, you know, we discuss, well, this, this, we can go forward on this aspect. This looks like a dead end and so on. And so we're always trying to work through the most practical and effective way of answering the questions that we set ourselves. I think it is most like the peptide sequence. It could be the synthesis because actually one of them, if you remember, came through a bit late and yep. they said they were having trouble with the synthesis. So that could be, maybe have a look at the data sheet. I think it's in the pile there somewhere. Yes, okay. Back in the lab, it's time to introduce the gold nanoparticles. So we grow the cells on a plate we add our nanoparticles on top, and then we measure them if they can move across that layer and into a gel underneath. And then we can take apart those different layers and measure how much gold is in each place. So it's another useful characteristic of the gold is that we can measure it quite easily compared to some other nanocarrier systems. We have a, quite a number of um, things that we have to jump in this. First of all, we have to get them to the brain. They then have to cross the, the blood-brain barrier to get them into the brain. And then they have to deliver their cargo molecule, which might be a gene or it might be a protein, to the right cell inside the brain or possibly to the spaces between the cells inside the brain. So devising something that does all of the things that we want to do is really a, a very difficult problem. And we have people working on targeting and people working on cargo and people working on where things get to. So it's a, it's a joint effort between uh, a lot of us. Hi, Igor. Hi, Connor. How are you? Good. So, to find out how his experiment has gone, Connor has taken his cell sample downstairs, where it's been prepared for analysis under the transmission electron microscope. EM manager Dr. Igor Kreev has some encouraging news. Right, and black dots there, you can see the nanoparticles, yeah. which we exposed cell to, and we uh, applied nanoparticles from top here, and they 
ended up here at the bottom of the cells. And that's the membrane side. And that is membrane side, exactly. This is excellent, actually. As a PhD student, um, my time spent a lot differently than my undergraduate time. So I'm not a proper student like I used to be and could go for beers on a Monday night. It all depends on the experiments you're going to do. So some days you will have to be there for 14, 15 hours to run the whole process. Some days you might only need to be in for two, three for meetings and you can do your reading and research at home. So it's, it's quite variable, but on average, you know, 50, 60 hours a week in the lab doing experiments, then back to your computer to work up the data, and then weekly meetings with supervisors and the research group as a whole. Departmental meetings are held regularly. Today, it's Connor's turn to talk about his work. So I have um, the molecule that I'm interested in, the BDNF. Um, to actually get it onto the nanoparticle without changing its structure much, we've had to alter it. And um, so I've, I've mutated a plasmid of it produced the protein, and then we had an assay to see if it works. Um, so you, you, on your flowchart, you suggest that you'll target Alzheimer's disease, but actually, if you're using BDNF, I think Huntington's disease would be a better target. Yeah, I, th I think just with Huntington's, especially if we have a mice model here that we can um, use for that would be very useful. Communication is about half of the job in some ways because you can do the most fantastic experiments but if nobody knows the results then you've just wasted your own time and, and, and money. Talking to colleagues is one thing, but Connor has a bigger date coming up. He's going to present a poster of his work at an international conference. David needs to make sure his student is fully prepared. I know this is conventional for a paper, mm -hmm. but it's actually probably a better idea to put the conclusion near the top because okay. people see it so much better rather than having to sort of squat down to see the conclusion at the bottom. And uh, actually, okay. that's really the most important thing. Yeah. So if you could switch those up to the, the top there. And then I think once you've got that done, um, off to the printing services and uh, it should be fine. The week of the conference has finally arrived. Clutching his brand new poster, Connor is off to Birmingham, where his research work will be shown to the international scientific community for the very first time. The Festival of Neuroscience is an annual event organised by the British Neuroscience Association. Held in Birmingham's imposing ICC Conference Centre, it attracts researchers from all over the world from Nobel Prize winners to students like Connor. It's a chance to listen to presentations on the latest cutting-edge science. And it's a chance for more informal discussions about future directions of research. So the poster session is about to start. I'm a, I'm a little bit nervous, to be honest. I've had quite a lot of caffeine to prepare for this, but um, I'm interested to see what people think. Excited, nervous, a bit of everything. <laughs> so I'm a second-year PhD student at the Open University and um, I, um, I'm working on this kind of nanocarrier system to get um, proteins primarily into the brain. Often students will present their data for the first time and it will probably not be complete data, it won't be as much as would go into a paper, but it's a very good opportunity for discussion to and fro because people will sort of gather around and say, why did you do that, shouldn't you do that? Sometimes they will say useful things like, oh, we tried that and it didn't work, which are the kind of things that you don't read about in the papers. So that, that would be the next question as soon as we get that on. So I thought the poster went OK. Um, I was able to answer most of the questions people asked and I managed to get a few people to listen to me, which is always a good start. And there's been quite a lot of people coming through. So yeah, it, it was good. Um, it's, di it's different. I mean, I always get to learn something new and I found a few people that I hope to meet in the future. Back in Milton Keynes, Connor is thinking about the thesis he's required to write to complete his PhD. The thesis is obviously a major part of the, the PhD. I mean, you can do all the lab work you want, but if you don't write it up, it kind of de defeats the process. It's this huge chunk of writing that we hope to do. The best way to progress with your PhD is to keep a track of it as you go along. I've done, at the beginning, a literature review on the topics that you're interested. I looked into other nanocarrier systems as well as my own into some of the useful cargoes that might be added on and then also into some of the targeting molecules. So I've kind of got those three separate headings there. 
Then every time I do an experiment, I keep uh, detailed methods of what, what I did, and then also a summation of, of what the experiment says. If it worked, if it didn't work, have a nice graph with some nice figures on it, hopefully, or some images to help present that. Ideally, you do this gradual process, and then within the last month or two, you kind of bring it all together with a, the discussion and conclusion. It doesn't always work out quite as smoothly as that, but that, that's, the, that's the goal. The Viver can be a little bit terrifying in the idea that you could do something for three, four years, spend all this time, and theoretically someone could tell you you, you don't get a PhD from it. It is necessary to make sure that not only is the work done correctly and that we can move on with it and use it as useful science, it's also important to basically demonstrate that you know more about this subject than anyone else in, in terms of you, it's your whole responsibility, it's your whole goal. My, my future plans after my PhD, obviously everything going well and I, f I finish it, uh, would be continue the research. Um, I'm quite passionate about this field. My ultimate goal in science is basically that something like Alzheimer's is no longer a, a curse. For the work at the Open University to lead to a realistic new treatment for brain diseases, it will take many people and many years of painstaking and at times frustrating research. The advice I would give someone who wants to do a PhD is get used to feeling. You will try experiments maybe 10 times and as long as you keep your data, make sure you know what you did, try to do something new maybe each time or learn from your mistakes, that's useful. But it can be a little bit soul destroying when you've tried something for the 20th time. It takes all day to do and it hasn't worked. So I think that's a useful thing. And then just simply hard work. You do have to rely a lot on your supervisors to help you along the way and also just general other people in the labs and I, I think there's a nice community there. Half the time it is um, it's quite tedious and it can be repetitive and you have to make sure things work and they work the same because if you can't repeat your own results then nobody else will be able to and then sometimes you get this fantastic result and it is so exciting and everybody takes their their stuff and they'll be showing everybody else what they've done so um, it, it is a very good career.